Hi everyone. Sorry, a bit late today. I hadn't realized I hadn't gone live. So anyway, thanks for joining us. Really good to, to, to see you guys. Um, we're going to delve straight into today's podcast, which is about movement. And first of all, I just want to say movement something I personally have always loved. In fact, when I was a junior doctor working in casualty, I was um, advised, well, I hadn't realized that on the whiteboard after my name was written the initials B.A.F. And they were doing sweepstakes to say to see how long it would take me to notice. And it took me four months because uh, I was busy working as a, an a doctor and I was always on my feet rushing around. And uh, one day I stopped and I noticed that it said uh, B.A.F. And, um, and the initials actually meant blue ass fly. So uh, that shows how much I love movement. However, for the majority of us, movement is something that we generally are programmed to want to uh, conserve. And also a bit like eating as well. We want to conserve our energy and we want to uh, maintain as many calories as possible because that was really important back in the day when we needed to uh, be hunters and gatherers and where you know, in between all those explosive bursts of energy, we wanted to rest. The problem in modern society, though, is that we've taken not moving and wanting to sit and, you know, be fed grapes and so forth. We've taken it to extreme. And unfortunately, it's almost been engineered out of our modern lifestyle, the simple, necessary act of moving. And yet it has so many health implications if you don't move enough. So to go on to describe... Um, now, uh, the, the structure of today's podcast, firstly, I'll begin to by explaining how simple exercise like walking uh, can benefit your, your heart, uh, it can reduce your risk of, of stroke, of diabetes, of um, osteoporosis or thinning of the bones, uh, how it can ease things like arthritis and low back pain, uh, it can lift mood, reduce anxiety, uh, and how it compacts depression and it reverses aging. So as you can see, there's a lot of positive health benefits to moving. I'll also provide an outline of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, how and why moving has been engineered out of modern life and we have to kind of make a conscious effort to move these days. Um, how and why we should make moving fun, you know, the importance of mixing it up. Specific movements to factor into your daily regime particularly if you're a stroke survivor or as anybody over the age of 30 living in the western world and who's starting to stiffen up and creak more how the wrong kinds of movement can accelerate arthritic changes um, down the line but also you know how it is your call between the risks versus the benefits of moving a lot um, and i'll intersperse it with my own experience of 34 years of moving a hell of a lot but with dense hemiplegia and also not just how it's impacted on me when I moved more but also how it impacted on me when I had periods of my life where I was I, I was basically moving less and I'll also give some examples from the clients who attend our garden therapy group many of them who've had strokes and how I saw the benefits of moving on them as well. The uh, references will come from uh, the likes of Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, GP broadcaster, uh, Gary Ward, who's an author educator on human movement, uh, Daryl Edwards, who's a, a personal trainer, health and movement coach, does a lot of international speaking, and he uses primal play uh, in his sort of uh, encouraging people to make movement fun. Uh, there's the Foot Collective, which is a Canadian bunch of physios who look at how the environment and our lifestyles are impacting on our skeletal structure, altering our movement patterns, and particularly how there is impacting on our feet. Um, and there'll be other um, sources, accumulated research uh, that I've done over the years from multiple sources, um, in my own interest. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it is our default position to want to, to chill, to relax, to consume all those tasty sugary snacks. But we we are doing it more than we really should do. And they there, and I'll tell you how bad it's become. There was an investigation done by the World Health Organization in Europe and the United States. 
that recently that showed that 50% of women and 40% of men in, in uh, Europe and the United States are moving insufficiently. And that's compared to in other parts of the world like Southeast Asia, where that number is only about, well, it's actually less than 20%. So we, um, we definitely are not, over half of us are not moving as much as we should be. Or sorry, under half of us, just under. Now we, we have become so fixated on calories and how our bodies look. Um, but what we don't understand is that actually, um, sorry, that's just shovel check on that. Oh, it's okay. I just wanted to check that I'm actually live and I am. Um, so what you need to realize is that, you know, weight loss, weight loss will occur naturally if you're moving more, you know, because all these other things interplay, like better sleep, moving more, eating better. All these things will naturally encourage you to shed your weight. And then you'll find that you're less likely to crave all those high carb, high sugary snacks. I mean, you may remember our last week before last, I talked about um, sleep and how if you wake up and you're very tired, you're more likely to have those ghrelin hormones knocking around that make you want to reach for instant carbs and those sort of uh, less uh, healthy snacks. So, you know, moving more can just help by itself to lose weight without, and you naturally then start to want to do the other things more, more healthily as well. Um, we know, and actually the other thing is that the more you move, the more you think about food as something that you eat in order to live. Whereas a lot of us, in, as we get older, we have the mindset that we should, we kind of live to eat. Um, so it'd be nice to go back to the way the kids used to do it, whereas I say they more eat to live. Prolonged sitting is becoming a really big health problem. And as is prolonged TV viewing, and the other issue with prolonged TV viewing, not only is it associated with an increased risk of mortality, but we know that if you sit and have TV dinners every night, that because you're distracted watching the TV while you eat, you are more likely to consume more calories. Movement is really important for boosting our immune system and it increases your natural killer cells. And you might remember uh, the other week I talked about these natural killer cells and they're very good at boosting your immune response and also uh, fighting cancer as well. It also improves something called mitochondrial biogenesis. And that's just basically a simple way of saying, a complicated way of saying it helps our body to make more energy. It basically packs your body with more of those Duracell batteries, which keep you running longer during the day. Um, it changes our gut microbes. And as you remember, last week we talked about gut microbes a lot. And you remember the multiple beautiful effects of having a good diverse set of gut microbes and how it benefits the rest of your body systems. Uh, it also is very important for regulating hormone dysfunction. So for example, in the menopause, as GPs, we will often ask our GPs, uh, our GPs, we will often ask our ladies who are struggling with their hot flushes and night sweats and, and, uh, and, and fatigue to exercise more as a way of helping to improve their hormonal imbalance. It improves your blood pressure, your circulation and your lymph flow around your body. And many of you who have uh, sort of more significant hemiplegia will be aware that because you have a part of your body that isn't moving, not just voluntarily, but involuntarily, it's not moving as much. It just doesn't have those small little uh, corrective movements going on. That when you're sat for prolonged periods, that side of your body will feel cold and seize up very quickly. Um, and you do definitely feel the cold more, but when you're moving, you don't feel the cold quite as much. And that's simply because when you're sat, if you're not pumping your muscles, then your circulation is slowing down, is a bit more sluggish. And so that's a direct effect. It's the fact that, you know, your circulation isn't moving as well. We also know that um, walking is one of the best things you can do to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Other health benefits include uh, reducing the risk of cancer, improving mental well-being, better quality of life, reducing the risk of heart attacks, strokes, and type 2 diabetes. And 
we do recommend that if possible, uh, try and avoid sitting for more than an hour at a time. Now, I know that that's really difficult. I mean, I'm, I am personally finding it really difficult at the moment, especially because I'm um, uh, revising to re-enter general practice and I'm also doing a book writing as well. So um, sometimes you're so absorbed in what you're doing that you do, uh, of, you know, you lose track of time. So now what I do is I try and um, check the time on my on my clock on on my computer monitor at the start and make a point of getting up you know every hour an hour and a half and and actually you know when i say get up i'm not talking about doing press ups and running around the place but even if you just get up and extend and stretch a bit and just also for good for your eyes look into the distance it does really help um at the end of your long sitting session when you eventually get up you do feel a bit less stiff so as I say, avoid sitting if you can for more than an hour or an hour and a half at a time without just breaking up with a very, very light activity. Morning exercises are better. Um, and so it's great that the physio sessions run in the morning, but also exposure to bright morning sunlight is really good light. And it doesn't have to be like a big bright sun in the sky. It, even if it's a cloudy day, the fact that you're getting natural daylight is really good for boosting the cortisol to set you up for the day, to get in the circadian rhythm going. And it's really good for helping you actually also to sleep later on in the day. So if you can get up and not only get out first thing in the morning, but also do your exercise outside in the morning, then you're killing two birds with one stone and it's so good for you all around. Research also shows that you're likely to live longer if you walk at least five and a half miles a week and that's really very little that equates to about 0.8 miles a day which is equivalent to about 1600 steps a day and you know even when you're even if you can't get outside in the winter months or for whatever reason um just moving from room to room or just to go to the bathroom or to the kitchen or to the bedroom you will be using up more steps than you think but give yourself reason to get up, to move. Try not to delegate things. Try not to put things up and do it all in one go. You will, you will really reap the benefits by moving more. And research shows that it will make a difference, have a positive impact on your health. You can walk at a slow pace. It doesn't have to be like, you know, uh, roadrunner speed. And even a pace of two miles an hour can be enough to lower risk factors to things like heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, uh, by up to 31%. So for us, that's really, really important. And people who walk further and faster get even more health benefits. So subtle hint, if you want to push yourself that bit further, go for it. Now, women who walk 30 minutes a day can cut their risk of stroke by 20 to 40%. I don't know why they just mentioned women. It could be because women on the whole in Western Europe tend to be less, slightly less active than men. And it just does so many good things as well in terms of getting the blood pumping around your body, which makes your heart stronger as well, and which also um, lowers your blood pressure, which is, again is important for people like us. If you walk, stepping it up a bit now, if you can walk those 10 magical 10,000 steps, which are often talked about, which is equivalent to about five miles a day, then you are at a really good level of overall health. And if you can't quite make that, then any walking is okay. You know, we all have to start with baby steps, but trust me, baby steps can only take you one way. They can only take you to bigger steps and bigger steps and, and you just keep climbing and climbing. So it's worth starting somewhere. Nobody starts at that magical figure that they want to get to, but everybody has to make the, the, the small steps that get you to that ultimate goal of yours. And it's worth persevering with it because you will succeed if you persevere. And to make it easier, you can use things like pedometers or uh, apps on your smartphone, uh, which can help you to count your steps. You can get a bit addicted to them, uh, admittedly. And you can even set yourself little personal goals. So in the early stages, 
you know, see how many steps you're doing a day or a week, and then maybe say, I'm going to try and increase it by 500 steps or 100 steps if you don't feel 500, if you feel 500 is too much the next week. And, and then you can monitor it also year by year. And even if you don't feel that you can increase it much over the years or over the months or over the weeks, at least try not to drop it. And that becomes even more important as you go through the winter months when, of course, it's harder to convince yourself to get up and move. But if you see, hey, I was doing this much during the summer, it might motivate you to do a little bit more during the winter months. Brisk walking does count as cardio exercise. So walking is as good for your heart as running if you do enough of it. You might have to do about twice as much walking as running. And, you know, it needs to be reasonably brisk as well to count. And that's great for somebody like me who, before my stroke, I was a county runner. I was, you know, a fit athlete. And it hit me hard that I couldn't do my running and my my, my racket sport playing and my, my, my two-wheel cycling. I have a recumbent, but it wasn't quite the same. Um, so I, um, I was really heartened to know that in terms of protecting my heart, and, and, and making me cardiovascularly fit, that if I was doing brisk walking, then that is actually beneficial. And when I go out first thing in the morning to walk the dog, uh, for two or three times, I will have a quick burst of, of, of walking as fast as I can to really get my heart pumping. And to, to also put, it's a strengthening exercise as well, which I'll come on to in a bit. So it really loads your bones and your muscles and it gets them to work that bit harder. And it, you can feel it, your pulse rate goes up and it's invigorating and it's good for your system just generally to do that, even if it's for very, very small bursts. And other ways you can do these short bursts of high intensity interval training called HIT, some of you may have heard of that, is by jumping. Um, you can try, if you're able to, squats or lunges. And, you know, I mean, I do squats and it's difficult, but I and I get down as far as I can. Uh, you can also do things like um, uh, putting uh, putting your arms behind you and a dipping down, something called a tricep dip, or putting your arms in front of you and just uh, going on all fours on the floor, using your good hand to straighten the fingers of your clawed hand open, and try and get it as flat as you can on the floor and on all fours. Just gently rock forward onto your onto your arms to put pressure down over your over your forearms and then the next stage from that is you could even try and do some press ups where you're you've got your your knees on the floor rather than going on your feet and do what you call knee press ups so that's a really good way of strengthening your upper body and lunges and squats are a really good way of strengthening your lower body if you feel that that lunges and squats are too difficult then you can try the exercise bike which most people, even when they have significant stroke, are able to manage, especially if they have a strap on the right pedal or the left pedal. Um, we know that uh, walking is very good for people with type 2 diabetes, which some of you may also have, because we know that when you exercise, it helps, to, uh, it helps the hormone insulin, which you'll have heard of, to get the sugar out of the bloodstream and it gets it into cells. By getting the sugar out of the bloodstream, the, it reduces the damaging effects of sugar in the bloodstream, such as kidney effect disease, uh, heart disease, eye disease, um, and nerve damage. Even just a 10 minute walk after a meal, after each meal can do the trick in terms of lowering your sugar levels. And we've, there's been research that shows that regular, regular light movement throughout the day can will reduce type 2 diabetes more than going to the gym just once a day. So sometimes, you know, if you're sitting all day and then you say, OK, I've been really inactive, I need to go to the gym, that isn't necessarily going to be any better for, me, for you than if when you're at work, you get up every so often and do some simple exercises or, you know, take the stairs rather than lifts or just walk around your office or do some exercises on the spot, you know, you will actually be doing more benefit to your health than just doing one load of intense exercise at the gym um, at night. And also there is risk with going to the gym and doing a lot of fixed flexion exercises after being 
sat all day because you're stiff and unless you do good warm-up exercises and stretches you can actually end up injuring yourself um, if you for example for those of you interested in calories if you were to take your dog out for a half hour walk you can burn about 100 calories and that obviously depends on your weight but so this is for somebody who's about 10 or 11 stone in weight but you know even just going out for half an hour with your dog or on your own it can you, you're burning calories as well and also if you are out walking try if you can to find somewhere leafy and natural to walk because there has been evidence there was scientists from stanford university who asked people to walk 90 minutes and they could either work walk in a woody area uh, or an urban area and those who strolled in nature had less activity in an area of their brain that causes depression than those that walked in a built up area. And that kind of corresponds with other evidence and other research which has shown that people who live in built up areas are more likely to get depression and anxiety than people who live in rural areas of the country. If you've got arthritis, you should be walking regularly, you should be exercising regularly. If you have achy, creaky knees or hips, then you have a very good reason to be on your feet and, and walking about. Because for starters, your joint fluid moves around when you do. And what that does is it provides oxygen and nutrients to your cartilage and your joints, which helps prevent friction. It also strengthens, strength, strengthens sorry, your legs and your core muscles as well. So, and I'll, I'll give you, I, I know many examples of patients who came to me with um, very significant arthritic changes in their knees or hips, um, and yet they were functioning pretty well. And it was because they'd kept moving throughout, and so they had such strong muscles, their muscles were splinting their damaged joints. And I can give you my own example. Um, when I had my shoulder surgery, I myself and the surgeon thought that I'd basically, I'd badly torn um, several of my rotator cuff muscles. And so um, they decided that I needed to have surgery on it. And leading up to surgery, I was still regularly, you know, using both arms to do the gardening. And I was still uh, doing my regular swims uh, and you know every session was at least a thousand strokes from front crawl non-stop and you know I was doing my sea swimming and so forth and but it was getting really painful uh, particularly in one position when my arm was in one position and I was really shocked and surprised when I had my surgery to learn that actually it wasn't rotator cuff damage of the tendons it was basically a severely arthritic shoulder joint. So I was just bone, it was just bone on bone. Uh, there was like no cartilage, the cartilage was just hanging on in shreds, it was like in pieces, so they had to like, take it all off. And I just literally have bone on bone now, which I'm gonna have to have a, a shoulder joint replacement uh, because it's not functioning at all now. And I would never have thought that, you know, because as I say, right up to surgery, I was still swimming a thousand strokes front crawl, and why? Because even though I had a completely uh, sort of dysfunctional joint, the muscles, I'd kept them strong throughout that time. And that allowed my arm to function to a degree until, you know, it stopped functioning. But it will get better again at some point, I've decided. So it's definitely worth um, keeping yourself active if you've got arthritis. And of course, you know, when your muscles are doing more, then your joints will hurt less. And also, of course, if you're moving more, then you will lose weight, you'll trim down, and you're putting less pressure through your joints as well. Because you get bigger, afraid your joints don't get any bigger, they stay the same size. So as you get bigger, you're just putting more pounds per square inch force through those joints and that is going to just exacerbate your arthritic pains. Walking is also really good for your bones uh, because it's a weight bearing exercise and the way it works is that when you put weight through your bones and um, it stimulates bone cells to grow and um, activities that make you bear weight against your own gravity are important 
uh, they, as I say, they not only uh, create more bone cells, but they stress your bones as well, and it makes them more solid. And an example of that is astronauts. Um, astronauts in space, no gravity, nothing to weight bear against. They have to make them do specific exercises to try and keep their muscles and bones strong. But even then, when they come back to planet Earth, there is a significant amount of bone density loss, which they then have to correct. And that's a problem that they're still trying to figure out how they're going to overcome it if they want man to do longer exploration to places like Mars and beyond. So, you know, bone, being able to put weight on your bones is so important. And astronauts are a classic example of the direct effects of not weight bearing on your bones. And of course, you know, for people like us who've had strokes, it's even more important that we keep our bones strong because when we fall, if you fall on your affected side, then you don't have what you call the writing reflex. So normally when you fall, your writing reflex will make sure that your arm automatically goes out to the side and it protects your fall as you go down. But on your stroke side, what happens is the opposite. Your arm sort of goes in. And, and so when you fall on that side, you put all the pressure down and all the, the, the impact of the fall down your stroke side. And that will increase your risk of getting a fracture. And if your bones are softened and weak, and you're, you're more likely to have a fracture, uh, that's something you can either have osteopenia or if it gets more severe it becomes osteoporosis so for people like us it's even more important and if you're anything like me i'm always tripping over all the time i'm always falling but i have never touched wood uh broken anything oh apart from a finger in a in a gate field gate when i trapped it um but uh you know otherwise i've had lots of falls sometimes on concrete but i've not fractured and i'm sure it's because i've kept putting density pressure and strain through my bones and of course eating well um, and the other thing of course is that if you strengthen your muscles then you are less likely to fall so whilst i've had in many falls i've also not uh, fallen as much as i could have done because there's been lots of times when i've been able to correct myself because my balance i've you know through my muscles i've been able to maintain some level of balance so as i say Think of things that you can do that can help to strengthen your, your bones. And it might be um, if you can't do things like using jumping, high impact jumping activities, then things like stretching, uh, using your own body weight. You don't even have to use weights. Um, but don't ignore your stroke side when you, in terms of trying to strengthen it. Um, and use your partner as well um, to help you if, if, if need be. So the other benefits of, of uh, moving includes reversing aging. You know, we the more muscle you have, the more muscle you keep. And from the age of 30, you lose between 3 and 5% of your muscle for every decade that you age. So as I've said already, try some strength training. And if you struggle even with light weights or the gym or squats or lunges or calf raises or tricep dips, then uh, or press ups, then even a static exercise bike is good, you know. So there'll be something that you'll be able to do. Muscle loss can affect how long you live uh, and how you, well your brain works as well. Um, exercise can improve your concentration and your memory, but strength training improves, improves your power of attention. So it's something worth doing. And my favorite bit of all this more muscle you have the more insulin receptors you have. And basically that just means you've got more cupboard space to store all that food. Now that's gotta be a good thing because it means that you can eat more. So, um, and that makes sense to me because when I was at university, my friends used to call me Thin the Bin because even though I ate like a horse and I ate anything and everything, I was always chucking food at myself because I was always permanently hungry. Um, and I love food as well. I, was, I remained stick thin. And they couldn't understand. And it's because I was all muscle. I was just pure muscle. It was like nothing other than just muscle. And so I had like, I was full of cupboard space. I had cupboard space all over the place. And so all this food was going in. It was going, oh, I'm going to go into that muscle cupboard and that muscle cupboard. So I was all right, you know. So um, so definitely 
there's so many benefits of having muscle and building on your muscle. Muscle also has a high concentration of mitochondria in it, and that means energy factories. So basically, the more muscle you have, it's like not only do you have all this cupboard space for your food, but you've also got like basically you're carrying all these Duracell battery packs. So like you're set up to get off and live your life, you know. It's worth also, as I said, trying to push yourself hard just for short bursts, for short intervals, that high intensity interval training I was talking about when you can. And it really doesn't have to be much. It can even just be 10 seconds. But just even if you just try a little bit, it will be it will reap you lots of benefits. So in summary, with strength training, the benefits are that you have better body composition, uh, more balanced, uh, increases your self-esteem, it reverses aging. It reduces the risk of coronary heart disease, um, stroke, diabetes risk, better insulin sensitivity, improve brain health, reduce muscle loss, reduce osteoporosis risk. That also includes osteoporosis of the spine. Now, you know, you might notice that as people get older, sometimes their spine becomes curved. And that's because if the vertebral bones start to soften, then they end up becoming wedge shaped. So they become shaped a bit like a Toblerone. And if you stack loads of Toblerones on top of each other, um, then you'll start to get a curved shape. And that's what happens in people's spines. So it can prevent that. It also improves your hormonal profile and it reduces stress and anxiety and you get less arthritic pain. So it's just like so many benefits to doing this. So I'm going to go on to talk about flexor chain, extensor chain. And this is particularly pertinent to people who've had strokes and to people who've had any injury or any illness that means that one side of their body is functioning better than the other so that they're slightly tilted or you know even if it's just one joint in your body that isn't working as well like a bad knee that means you're perhaps slightly putting more weight on the other side it applies to everybody who basically lives in the western world uh, because by default we are sitting more so this next section applies to literally everybody if, unless you're, you know, somebody living in Southeast Asia who basically uh, moves all day and squats all day, uh, in which case, you know, you can switch off doing this bit. Um, so we have our flexor chain and we have our extensor chain. The flexor chain is basically everything that draws us forward. Think about it. There's lots of things we do in the day that draw us forward, that flex us up, that bend us, that make us sort of are like this, yeah, in our legs and in our arms. And more so if you've had a stroke, because when you've had a stroke, you're, um, you have groups that extend and, and opposing groups of muscles that flex. So in your arm, for example, you know, I bend, but then there's a, a, a group of muscles on the other side that extend. But when you've had stroke, the groups that flex work better are stronger than the ones that extend and so the flexing groups becomes tight and short and the, the extensor groups underneath become weak because they're not able to work as well so they also become weak uh, they also become tight as well so we have it kind of doubly bad in a way or, or it's, a, it's a double trouble for us yeah but everybody who spends you know significant periods of time in the day sitting is going to be uh, affected by by their flexor chain muscles becoming very tight over time and that's one of the reasons why there are more younger and younger people presenting with things like knee problems and hip problems and it's not young people who are obese or physically inactive it's actually the opposite it's, it's often people who are very active but they have bursts of intense activity but rest of the day they're more inactive and they don't have normal patterns of movement. So I'm going to describe this in a bit more detail. You think of your body as like made up of hardware and software. So I think most of you understand about, you know, computer systems have the hardware, uh, and that's like the backbone of, of your computer on which you can run your software functions. And if your hardware isn't set up properly, then the software programs won't run properly. So your hardware is basically your skeleton and your joints, yeah? And if your skeleton is not uh, properly aligned, 
then everything that runs on your skeleton isn't going to function properly. And I'll give you an example of that. And I'll probably have to stand for this bit. Um, you, sat, you sat in your chair and you've been sat in your chair for a few hours. And you do that from, you know, when kids um, are preschool, they're great. You know, they're, they're so bendy everywhere, aren't they? And I've got a grandson and it's just wonderful seeing how bendy and how he can move in all planes. And it's like, it's, it's fantastic. And, you know, when he can start to walk properly, he won't be able, he won't have a problem with, uh, you know, squatting. And a lot of people in, in other parts of the world squat into old age. But we can't do that. A lot of people in the West can't do that. And there's a reason for that. That's because when you sat in a chair for a long period of time, you're, I'll stand up for this. So you stood up and I shall just tip this forward a little bit. So basically, this is your hip flexor muscle group sit here. As you will notice, the hip flexors, uh, they make you go forward. Now imagine you're sat in this position all day long. Your hip flexors, when you stand up, are really tight, and over time they become tighter and tighter. And we don't necessarily do anything to extend those hip flexor muscles. So what happens? You've got two options. You stand up, and you either, because of the tightness in these hip flexors, you either walk like this, and I must admit, when I'm uh, gardening, uh, and I've been stooped over for a long period of time, when I get up, I'm a bit like, prehistoric man and then I gradually evolve into homo sapien and stand up but it takes me a while because I'm so tight here and I'm so tight in my back you know so either you can't stand up straight or you stand up straight but your pelvis is tilted forward and a lot of people have forward tilted pelvises because they have tightness in their hip flexors so and also their muscles at the front of their thighs are very, very tight as well. So, um, and the problem with a forwardly tilted pelvis is that it means that the, the ball and socket joint in your hip is unable to move properly and it kind of almost switches off, yeah? And so you put more load through your leg muscles and you put more load through your knee joints and you put more load through your foot as well, your feet as well. and really what should happen when you stand up is you should activate your bum muscles that the, that's the juicy gluteus maximus you should be activating that and you should be activating your core muscles but in a lot of people your bum muscles are really really tight or basically switched off and your core muscles are really weak so if there are two things that you want to try and work on it's strengthening your core and waking up those glutes so that's, that's what you need to do. Simple as that. How do you do that? Well, um, you can uh, wake up your core by moving is a really good start, um, you know, walking, um, but also things like Pilates, yoga, Tai Chi can help as well. Now I understand you'll be going, uh -oh, no, uh -oh, not, I can't do that. Well, I'll tell you something. I, spent my first 30 odd years with stroke uh, because I was such an athlete before stroke, thinking that activity was all about, you know, really, uh, you know, pushing yourself, going to the gym, uh, looking at the other people, I say, well, I can do this on my step or row or whatever. And I was like, cardiovascularly really fit and I was doing my three-day trekking up mountains and you know all my other ex exploits and whatever it was great and I don't take any of it back but I didn't do any of the stretching and I didn't I wasn't strengthening my core although the swimming was helping a bit with the core admittedly and I certainly wasn't I didn't even know my glutes were important to be honest <laughs> I certainly didn't realize that glute weakness in your glute muscles is one of the most common causes for low back pain so I, you know, I was just concentrating on cardiovascular fitness and increasing my performance times every week. And it was only in the latter years of working before I had to take ill health retirement that I, I sort of realized I was getting a lot more back pain. And my physio would say to me, you used to be a lot fitter and have a lot less back pain when you were out digging the garden all day, which I found ironic, but she was right. And what had changed was that 
whilst I was still doing my swimming and going to the gym, I was also had four jobs. I was working seven days a week. Um, I was sat for a lot longer during the day. Um, I was doing a lot of uh, uh, reading and writing reports. Um, I was sat on a lot more committees. I was doing a lot more driving. And the effect of that was that I was in a permanently contracted state and I wasn't doing anything to reverse that. And my core was getting weaker and weaker because whilst I was having bursts of activity, in between that I had prolonged times when I was sitting, but sitting in a very sort of contracted state and also a bit stressed as well. And you know, my thoracic spine, which is between your shoulder blades, um, was getting like rigid and tight. My neck was getting tight. I had constant low back pain. I'd often have to stand in meetings because sitting was too painful. And it was when I retired, I thought, you know what, I need to do something here. It was when my old my oldest son said, Mum, you should try yoga. And I was struck when I tried doing a session with him and his girlfriend. I was like a plank of wood. I was literally a plank of wood. And, you know, I could argue, well, that's the stroke's fault. That's not my fault. But actually, no, it was my fault. I had been working so hard on building my cardiovascular strength and doing things over my life which i absolutely endorse because movement should be fun if, if you don't enjoy moving then you're not going to be persevering with it you've got to find something you love and just that will get you moving you don't even then think about it but what i wasn't doing is i wasn't thinking about stretching i wasn't thinking about the fact that no matter what i did I'm always going to have one group of muscles that are working harder than the other group of muscles. And I'm just getting shorter and shorter in my muscles and tighter and tighter. So I started stretching and oh boy, for the first few months, it was so painful. I kept putting it off. I hated it. Um, it was like agony. It was torture. Why would anybody want to put themselves through that? I would rather put myself through the agony and torture of climbing a mountain and end up with bleeding toes than the pain I had through trying to stretch very tight, tight muscles from stroke. But I did it and now I can't stop doing it because once I got past a point of moving, began to move again the way I should try to or getting the joints on the, the muscles to move and stretch better, the benefits were, were spectacular. I found that I was lighter, I was more balanced, my breathing was improved as well because you've got to remember that when you are very tight your chest cavity closes up and you're only using the upper third of your 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 chest to breathe and i realized that when i was doing my uh, mindful i went on a mindfulness course and i was doing these mindfulness breathing and i sort of thought i can't breathe in and breathing out is really difficult <laughs> you know and i suddenly realized i can't do basic thing like breathe so something's up here, but actually it was just down to the fact that everything was so closed up and so tight from many years of stroke. And many of you are young and you are going to live long, really fingers crossed, happy, healthy lives. So I implore you, you know, as somebody who 34 years on has had a very active life, that whilst you go about your business, please don't forget that you know, if you have any weakness in your bodies, you know, do stretch yourself out because it will really help you years down the line. And you'll feel so much freer in your movement and, and you'll have less pain in your sleep better as well because you'll go to bed and you won't be, oh, I'm uncomfortable in that position, I can't move in that position and keep tossing and turning. You know, you'll actually be more like relaxed and like a rag doll as you should be. So from a personal point of view, I can really endorse you know, um, strengthening your core um, and stretching. And in terms of weight, waking up your glutes, your gluteus muscles, uh, the book by Rangan Chatterjee, The Four Pillar Plan, is really good in terms of showing some exercises. But there are other um, sites as well that you can go to, uh, which will, uh, Gary Ward, who I mentioned earlier, if you just Google his name, uh, he has a, 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 a really good um website which shows you exercises you can do as well so that certainly i would recommend that you you know you look at trying to strengthen your core muscles and that you wake up your glutes and and stretch yourself and i i now stretch myself every morning or you know as often as i can and uh 
then I take the dog out for a, a long walk. So, you know, whatever it is that you can do, it, and, and just be mindful of your bodies as well. Think, you know, where does it feel tight? Where does it feel like, you know, and and do and don't ignore it. You know, it's very tempting to ignore it at the moment. This right arm is really doing very little, and it hurts every time I move it. And I really don't feel like I want to cause inflict pain on myself. But I know that if I don't keep it moving, um, even if it means having to ask Mike to help me, that it's going to seize up and it's going to be giving me even more problems. So invest time in those bits of your body that you perhaps don't really want to invest much time in. And the other thing I'm going to say to you is join a class. Now, this may sound a bit controversial, and I'll be honest, I was very reluctant to go to any classes for many years. And 30 years, actually, it took me before I, I actually joined. Uh, uh, I mean, I used to go to the gym all the time, you know, from when I was young. But that was different because I was, you know, I could do my own thing in the corner, you know. But going to a class, oh, that's different, isn't it? It's a very scary proposition because you're in a small, intimate space with a group of people and everyone can see everyone and you're in your, you know, your lycra clothes, whatever it is, and you, or your, your baggy leggings. And you just feel very self-conscious. And, and often you're barefoot as well in these classes, which is difficult. Um, and I decided that I was going to give it a go. Um, it was one after I, I, I retired and um, I went to, I joined a local uh, leisure centre and I started going to the Pilates and the yoga and, the, and then I went on to a bar class. And, and when I first went, I was terrified and I was really self-conscious. But I quickly realised that people are too focused on their own activities they're too focused on the the, the 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 suffering that they're going through they're trying to get their own movements right and try, making sure they don't break wind as well you know because the positions you get in so and and i realized that actually it wasn't as bad as i thought and most importantly it was more fun than doing it on my own because i had missed like not doing exercise with other people it's something i did a lot of before the stroke i did a lot of team sports so being back in an environment where i was exercising with others was actually fun and i found that it wasn't that hard to well it wasn't hard at all to do it with able-bodied people and if anything i felt like people were looking at me thinking well done you you know for coming and not being self-conscious about yourself and being able to laugh at yourself. And, you know, there were times when I had to get in positions and I was like literally just falling right over. But then I just, but then there'd be other people who struggled, people who had back pain who were there, who were struggling with some of the movements that I could do. And then there were some movements I couldn't do. So, you know, it obviously pick your class. It might, you don't want to go to the, one of these ones which have got, you know, super fit, competitive, you know, not very nice people in, but um, you, you you want to sort of find yourself a nice class and, and, and give it a go. And I'll tell you another reason why it's worth doing it. You know, I think just like when, you know, my generation, my parents' generation would go into a local pub in the 1970s or 60s, you know, and you'd be the first black person or whatever Asian person to go in and people would like look at you and, you, or, and then you realise actually they're not looking at you as much as you thought they might be. Uh, and if they were, you just sort of like learn to ignore it. Same should be for us for stroke, because unless we get out there, unless we put ourselves out there and show face and show people that, yeah, we're here, we're not going anywhere. And there's nothing different about us. We've still got our marbles. We've still got our sense of humor. We've still got a hell of a lot to offer society. Unless we do that, then we're not opening the doors for other people for it to be comfortable and easier for other people to go out whether it's going out for a meal just going out in public i'll give you some examples to finish off um, with um, some clients of mine who joined the garden therapy group and when they came majority of them felt they couldn't do very much and were very worried about when i asked them to try doing various things and every single one of them ended up more doing more than they thought they could one example was a chap who walked managed eventually to walk all the way around our garden through our woods out the other end and he was just so gobsmacked because prior to that he'd only walked a few meters that he um and he'd had his stroke over two years ago and he was relatively young 
he was in his early 60s, he was so amazed and, and, and proud of himself after all that. It took him a few weeks, of course, that he actually decided to learn to drive. And now he's, he's all over the place. He just can't stop him. Um, another lady, she had a very dense hemiplegia down. It was a flaccid arm, uh, very dense down her um, left-hand side. And she built up so much confidence from coming and doing the garden therapy and being with her in a safe space, realizing she could do more and be more active than she thought that she actually rejoined her ballet class. <laughs> and uh, even though she couldn't use one side of her body, she just still loved it because she used her other side and, and she loved being back with her friends. And it, she, she eventually started to stand and do some of the moves standing. And she was even seen down the local pub having a bit of a jig uh, to uh, a live band. And her husband previously would have been very embarrassed of her doing something like that, embarrassed taking her out, he, he admitted. But he actually changed from being embarrassed to her to being really proud of her um, because you could see that she was becoming proud of herself as well. So it had a real impact on other people. And, and probably our, our least active client who was wheelchair bound and wouldn't even get out of a wheelchair, eventually we convinced her to transfer to a chair and she ended up doing a little bit of gardening. She would bend down and she would use the trowel to dig holes to plant vegetables and, and, and flowers. And as a result of that, she built up her core strength. And as a result of that, she built up her confidence. At home, she started to pick things off the floor when they fell, rather than asking her husband. And they decided that they were going to ask a private physio to come, even though, as many of you, she'd been told she had plateaued. She decided to get a private physio in. And because she had one goal was to be able to climb the stairs so she could join her husband in bed. And she managed to do that and I remember her sending me a lovely text to say that she had actually managed to climb the stairs on her own and that every night she now joined her husband in bed and that was just goes to show that we all have it in us to move more than we think we can move and there there's no downside to it you know it's only positive it's only beneficial it does require effort but being ill, feeling unwell, feeling down requires even more effort. So I hope that's made some sense today. It's been lovely talking to you. Sorry, I've rabbited on longer than usual. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye for now.